Hey everyone, you're listening to the 107 Podcast, where we get together every fortnight, and sometimes more often, to talk about technology, business, and the humans in it. I'm your host, Ivan Stegic. My guest today is Ethan Marcotte, an independent web designer, writer, and speaker. He coined the term responsive web design in a talk given at an event apart Seattle in April of 2010, and I'd argue the web has never been the same since then. Ethan says that his practice involves helping companies make beautiful things that work everywhere, and I just love that sentiment. Welcome to the show, Ethan. It's so nice to have you on the show. Yvonne, thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Let's start out by talking a little bit about where you are in the world right now. Where are you joining us from, and what do, what do you see outside your window? Oh, okay, geographically. I think you meant like existentially or something. Um, oh, we could talk about that too, <laughs> if you like. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I'm, I'm based in, uh, in Somerville, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. I've been here for, wow, about 20 years now. Right outside my window, I see a beautiful brown house that lives right next to mine. And it's been, uh, the weather's been a little monsoony lately. It's been raining pretty hard. We had a tropical storm roll through a few days ago, and we're, uh, I think, still dealing with some aftershocks from that. But it's, uh, yeah, yeah, otherwise, uh, I, can, I can see some nice things out my window. So you're in New England, um, which mm-hmm. I know is where you went to college. Is that where you right. were born? Where where about does your life start? Yeah, yeah. I, I was born in New England. I'm I'm from northern Vermont originally, from a pretty rural part of a pretty rural state. And uh, yeah, spent the first 18 years of my life there um, before going to school at Middlebury College in Vermont. It's a part of the country that I, well, I haven't been there in the last year and a half or so uh, due to the circumstances, but uh you know, it's some place that I try to get back and visit with some frequency because it's uh, it's just a really beautiful part of the country. And that's, I assuming, you went to the the um, elementary and high school system in the city that you were growing up in. Yeah, yeah. City is a, a very kind <laughs> word for it. it. It was a very small town. Very small town. I mean, it's it's um, the the part of the country I come from is still very heavily farming focused um, a lot of dairy farmers my grandparents were dairy farmers there's not a lot of industry up there um, there's some logging there's some grain farming yeah but I, I did go to the public school system there well that's not quite true my 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 grade school was uh, you know a small small little Catholic school graduated from a high school of about 400 students you know so that's uh, that oh, was that was the big city out for me. exactly well felt, felt felt big at the time but uh, yeah by yeah. by everyone else's standards it was you know intimate definitely. and what did you want to be while you were a child when you were growing when you were growing up what did you want to be when you grew up I guess oh, is the question yeah. man. fireman yeah uh, yeah well fire, sure no Aust- I remember ast- astronaut and uh, at one point ghostbuster yeah um, yeah yeah so uh ghostbuster <laughs> well you know i wanted to be that too exactly who didn't <laughs> it was so awesome who didn't I, yeah I, I might have uh, might have seen that movie a few too many times at the theater when it came out but, yeah uh, no i ran the gamut i think of like fairly stereotypical like young american boy you know professions from yeah astronaut I, i'm sure i wanted to be a teenage mutant ninja turtle at one point um but uh, yes but eventually like um I think the things that gravitated more toward were were writing. That was a big, important sort of like lifeline for me when I was in high school, just having a place to kind of like write my own stories, to kind of get ideas down that weren't, you know, sort of constrained by assignments. You know, I could sort of like have a place to, mm-hmm. you know, sort of like process things. And, and that was pretty important to me. So and going into high school, at least I, you know, had this pretty firm idea that I was going to grow up and be a writer, which is, uh, you know, really everyone's favorite career path, I'm sure. But... <laughs> Did you keep a journal? I kept a few different journals. Routines and I weren't, you know, necessarily the thing I was the best at growing up. Mm. At least when I first started doing it, like my my parents, 
had invested, and this is, you know, in the in the middle of the 80s, like they, they were some of the first folks that I knew of, at least in where I was growing up, who had personal computers. And so a lot of the writing that I did was on like these big, clunky, old, you know, desktop computers. So there's probably some like f- five and a quarter inch floppy disks in some drawer oh, somewhere man. that are just filled with terrible, terrible TDH writing. But yeah, so most of my journaling was was electronic back then. Yeah, I remember those big clunky computers and the and the um, five and a quarter inch. Yep. And three and a half inch floppies. Uh, oh three man, and a half inch gang, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, Daisy wheel printers. I mean, just you know, there's nothing. Oh yeah. 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 yeah I I think I um I used Word Perfect. Oh man. Five. Sure. And saved things to floppy disks, and I think there's a. A couple of floppy disks buried in a tin can in the house I grew up in in South Africa somewhere. Amazing. So, yeah, it's um, that brings me way back. So, you wanted to be a writer then, I guess. If you if you went and got a degree in English Lit at Middlebury, did you go in thinking you were going to be a writer? Yeah, I did go in thinking I was going to be a writer, and I took I think I took like exactly two sort of creating writing courses, and then a few other more sort of like literature focused classes. And I think that's, you know, pretty early on, I just kind of realized like I really enjoyed reading and sort of like finding my way through somebody else's work and trying to bring like some sort of like trying to unravel, you know, why somebody wrote something a specific way or trying to understand the context that they were writing in, whether it's historical or political or artistic finding out why certain authors would maybe write something in response to things that they were experiencing. There, there was something about trying to understand the writer's perspective and the purpose of a text that, at least back then, I thought was really exciting. And so that's, that's sort of why the transition happened for me. And I'm sure, it, like at the time, as an 18-year-old growing up in college and thinks he knows everything, like... I probably thought there was probably more of a chance of getting a job after school if I continued on with graduate studies, maybe thought about teaching. And, and, and for most of college, that was kind of my plan was to, you know, finish up undergrad and, and get a degree and, you know, maybe get a doctorate somewhere. But at least at the time, I didn't see like following this like path of trying to understand like why certain things have been written in the way that they were. And I didn't see that as necessarily being mutually exclusive with continuing to be a writer if I wanted to. And it was just something that was really exciting to me at the time. So I decided to kind of run after it. And what was your first job out of college after you did graduate? My my first job out of college was working for a tiny little dot com just outside of New York City. The reason I did that was... I think by the the time I got to senior year, I was pretty burned out on on academics. And I was starting to sort of like look ahead and start to think about like, okay, well, if I did sort of want to treat this as a career, what does that look like? And I'd been getting more involved in the department at that time and just sort of realizing that there's no necessarily, there's not necessarily a promise of like any kind of security that comes with this. There has to be a real like fire in you to to really dedicate the rest of your life to to that kind of study. My thesis advisor, who's this amazing woman named Marion Wells, really got me through that that period where she she said something that just really stuck with me, which is, just take a year off from school. You don't have to make this decision right now and put the books away for a year and see if you miss them. Mm. I'd never really been given the space to do something like that before. And I think that that's that advice of like moving away from a thing to see if there's any kind of signal there that you might actually be missing it. That's something I've come back to over and over again. So decided to kind of put the books away for a year, 20 plus years into putting the books away to see if I missed them. And I guess I haven't yet, but, um, (laughs) uh, you know, so you worked. Yeah. Yeah. I worked for a little dot com. Basically I'd been doing some web design on the side, got a uh, copy Photoshop somehow. And I've been building web pages for some organizations and for some tiny, tiny little clients in college. And I figured I'd see if I could try to, you know, get a job working on this internet thing I'd been hearing more and more about. And so Marion Wells gave you permission to put the books away. Hmm. 
and you did yeah. and now and and then you became a lead designer <laughs> I, I think you were at harvard for a long time how, how does someone who goes from english lit become a lead designer at harvard at a department in harvard uh so i was at harvard for a few years I did about a year outside of New York, and then I moved up to Boston for for a a, a studio job. And then um, this was about the time that in the early two thousands there was a pretty significant industry crash, and mm. the consulting studio that I was working for, you know, was basically starting to go through layoffs, and I was seeing more and more of my friends go away. And I figured I might as well, like, uh, you know, try a different industry, and ended up getting a job at Harvard doing some web design for basically some like educational products that were used at the university. I was there for a few years and, you know, I was the lead designer on a couple software teams, partly by the merit of the fact that, you know, I was the only designer on those teams. So, um, <laughs> but there was, you know, I worked with some really wonderful folks there and getting a chance to work on some of the first web applications, uh, quote unquote, um, that I'd really ever used on a regular basis was really kind of helpful for me as a designer because, I mean, you know, working prior to that point on a lot of brochure heavy sites, really sort of like relatively static sites and fairly complicated and sizable ones, but like having to deal with something that could think about different user states, the different ways in which people need to think about processing information, really educational in a lot of ways. It feels like there was a period in the evolution of the web where and right at the beginning, all we were really doing is listening to print designers say, take this brochure and put it on the web. <laughs> yeah. we, we just need to make it digital. And it was an okay way of, you know, running a business to start to, you know, when you're, when you're trying to make men's meet and when you're trying to build something. But you very quickly, you very quickly kind of get to a point where, oh man, I really wish I was some interactivity here. It was a little bit more complex and people were thinking about the user experience. Totally, totally. Did you have that same experience early on? Like when when about did that happen for you if you did? I'm glad you said that, Yvonne, because like I, I remember one of the first sort of like small company clients I, I worked with out, out of college. I remember them writing something down on a post-it note. And this was somebody I think who they, they might have been in construction or or some trade, and you know this is for their business. And I remember them writing something down on a post-it note and handing it to me, and just asking me to put that on their homes on their home screen. Like that's that's that's. <laughs> I mean, it should be that easy, right? Like it should be you know something right. as simple as like, okay, I have this an idea, and I want to just like you know put it on this this internet thing I keep hearing about, but. Um, you know, it's it's sadly never been that easy, but I, I loved that image of, you know, just, all right, we should be able to perfectly translate this this and put it in exactly this spot. But I guess like I that that transition you mentioned, I guess it happened in a couple different ways early on. One one is I think, you know, I mentioned that Harvard job and that was sort of the first time I'd worked on an application on an ongoing basis where there was a community using this, like a community of learners or students who were working with this and reporting in ways in which the the application was failing them. And you know, I'd, I'd worked on web applications before. I'd worked on sort of like large large scale content sites before, but this is the first time I really had that feedback loop of like the decisions that we make on this product actually have some sort of impact on people, and that design really ultimately is a service job. And that was that was helpful for me. But I think the other part too, and you know, at my studio job when I was shortly after we moved to Boston, was about the time that I came across John Alsop's A Dow of mm -hmm. Web Design. Mm -hmm. It's it's one of those articles that if if your listeners haven't read it, man, I, I I know I can't give folks homework, but you know, it's it's one of those things that I just recommend to everybody because I think it really is still one of the most like relevant pieces of writing about the web as a design medium today because he is talking about that dis that division between um, the printed page and the web and saying that these are effectively completely different media that we need to design for. And that yeah. at least when he was writing, he was arguing that we were treating the web as a printed piece of paper, that we were, you know, sort of design some dis dimensions in a canvas in Photoshop, and then we'd fill that canvas with stuff. And then we'd, you know, go about perfectly translating that picture of a web page into HTML and CSS. Well, 
maybe not CSS back then, but, uh, you know, he was basically saying that we need to think about this as a completely flexible medium, basically, that this is something that can learn from print, but shouldn't mimic it. And that by treating it as the printed page, we're effectively limiting its capabilities and its strengths. And that, that just really resonated with me because it just showed me that there's a completely different way of thinking about design for the web that not a lot of folks are practicing. I, I hear what you're saying, and I, and I remember all the graphic designers that were trying to very quickly retool their skills mm, mm-hmm. so that they could remain relevant to design for the web. And it was really tough to, to do that, especially if you had been doing graphic design for 20, 30 years prior yeah, to that. Absolutely. And now all that print work is drying up. I'm so glad you mentioned John Alsop because I was just looking at his uh, Twitter profile mm, the other mm. day. And I pull it, I pulled it up again, and it says, "Great grandfather of RWD." <laughs> I, I saw and I couldn't that. figure out what that yeah, meant. Yeah, I saw he added that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, in a lot of ways. Yeah. Let's take our listeners to what that actually means. <laughs> um, you coined the term, the phrase, "responsive web design," right. and we'll we'll get to where that came from in just a sec. Um, but. Yeah, why why does it say that? In his yeah, profile? yeah. I mean, I mean, in a lot of ways, John is right because um, the first, you know, the first talk that I did where I coined the term "responsive web design" was titled "A Dow of Web Design." I was taking that, you know, as somebody who's a fan of John's article. You know, I was trying to resonate with that yeah. title because what he's arguing is that the the web has to be designed for adaptability. He's not talking about like responsive design as such. He's not talking about flexible layouts necessarily or media queries because the tools that we had to design web pages back when John was writing were so limited comparatively to what we have today. But that idea of thinking about treating the design of the web as something that ultimately is controlled by the people who are accessing it. And that could be the size of the screen, the kind of browser they use, the kind of assistive technology they use. That's such a, that's such an inversion of the model of the graphic designer as someone who dictates the experience to the user. And, yeah. and that, yeah. at least for me, is, is what's so revolutionary about John's, John's piece is that we need to let go of that control. And I think that in doing so, we actually gain a considerable amount of, we can, we can basically leverage the strength of the web to be as accessible as possible, um, no matter wherever or whenever you happen to be, uh, regardless of the screen you happen to be using to access my work. It's so empowering of the user and really focuses in on the user's experience. And so early on, I mean, his article that you referenced has been around for a yeah. while. Yeah. And I just, I, I love the idea that there's this complete inversion that the, the graphic designer isn't telling you what's cool. <laughs> right. The graphic designer is just putting out the content in a way that anyone can access it, whether it's a screen reader or a modern yeah. browser. Yeah, that's that's just great. Let's let's talk about um, that talk you gave at Event Apart in Seattle in 2010. That was before you published the the blog post that basically started everything, right? And the talk was influenced by this article from John. Yeah, and and it was influenced by that article because my career had been influenced by that article. You know, I'd been a fan of creating non-fixed width layouts, you know, flexible layouts, we called them, or fluid layouts, we'd call them pretty fluid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty much since, you know, since I read that, because it seemed like an interesting technical challenge. It seemed like a really interesting design challenge, like thinking about ways in which we can create designs that are more resilient and more adaptable. But that said, I mean, trying to do that in the early 2000s was pretty difficult because, you know, ultimately, like the reason, one of the many reasons that flexible layouts weren't super popular is that, you know, if you're on a very wide screen, things start to feel a little bit ropey or disconnected. If you're on a very tiny screen, columns can feel a little bit cramped. And so folks took a lot of Mm -hmm. comfort in that idea of creating a design that was always a specific width, in part because, well, it afforded them some illusion of control that they could basically say like, Mm -hmm. if you have this minimum screen resolution, then our design is going to look wonderful. But the problem is, is that eventually mobile devices came along and Mm -hmm. broke that in half. 
that is part of what went into that original talk is because I'd been doing more and more work around that time on sites that had a separate mobile website. And this was a fairly common pattern back then, right? Because like, you know, clients would have the full yeah. website that they designed that was for the desktop web. But then they started to realize that, oh no, more and more of my users are actually coming to this site on mobile devices. And we haven't accounted for that. We've sort of assumed everyone's gonna have a, a fairly comfortably sized screen and they're always gonna be interacting with a mouse or something like that. Getting asked on more and more contracts to do a standalone mobile website or more frequently in the contracts, it would specify an iPhone website. Well, on principle, it felt like a weird reversal of like how universal the web was supposed to be. It's like, why can't I yeah. access the same information or the same content on any device that I happen to use? And it also felt like a little bit of a like I wasn't sure what the end game of that fragmentation was supposed to look like because what's the next device that we're going to have to start designing for? Um, iPads, right. uh, iPads didn't exist back then, but you know, um, no, you know, uh, was I going to be doing like a a handspring only uh, website or a BlackBerry only website? I mean, if we thought about this as a flexible medium that could adapt more intelligently, you know, that that seems like a much more powerful and more sustainable approach ultimately. I agree. And do you do you remember before the M dot sites there were WAP sites, W A P sites? Oh my goodness, yes, yes. And it felt like M dot was just a better version of a WAP site. And and I I don't think it was sustainable. Yeah. I think maybe part of the irony is that um the iPhone came out with mobile Safari and could actually display a desktop site and then you had to double tap to actually zoom in. I remember seeing that for the first time and thinking, Holy cow, we can get the real web on a mobile phone now? Amazing. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think in all fairness, like there were really capable mobile browsers that predated the iPhone. The technology had been improving, but I think it took, especially Western markets, uh, seeing the iPhone and seeing it load up the homepage of the New York Times, that was a, a splash of cold water in a lot of you know folks that were designing in, in our markets. I, I say this a lot, but I, I, I do remain kind of surprised and humbled at the reception that the article got, because I, I really think that the reception that it did get just pointed to the fact that if I hadn't settled on the idea, I think somebody else would have, because... I think there was this broad mm. understanding that the idea wasn't sustainable, that our, our current ways of working just weren't going to serve us well for more than a few years of, of the mobile web or whatever came next. Also, you gave it a name. You labeled <laughs> I, it, and people people understood what that was. Yep. What's the story behind the, the words you chose, responsive web design? I, I know that there's a story that you didn't just, you know, it didn't just come to you, that you must have toiled over this. So it was a bit of a process. So I'd agreed to write this talk for, for an event apart. And while that was happening, I basically just decided like I'd finished up a client project and that was the first time that I'd created these really complex fluid grid-based layouts. And I'd come up with a sort of a unique technique for doing that. Around that time, I'd started learning about media queries, thanks to an article in a list apart written by Craig Hockenberry. And that was the first time that I realized that these two things could actually go together. Like I could create really interesting, mm. flexible layouts that didn't have an ideal width or ideal shape. But then I could still change them in useful ways depending on certain conditions. And back then it was really just the width of, or height of the screen, but I could come up with something that was closer to what John was proposing back in a DAO web design. So that was roughly the technique, but I had no idea what to call it. And, you know, my wife, Elizabeth, gets a lot of the credit for this because she was visiting some family down in New York City and visiting the High Line, which is a restored section of above ground um, train tracks that are, they're beautifully landscaped and beautifully renovated and beautifully designed. And there is some seating in certain sections of the High Line that basically they sit on tracks, like they almost look like small, like little railway tracks. And... I, my imagination got really fired up about that because it was this really cool model of creating a space and then inviting the users of that space to kind of rewrite it in ways that were useful that, for them. So like being able to literally move seating around in a public uh, area was, I don't know, 
I hadn't really seen anything like that before. So I started reading more about that. And then I started learning about this concept of responsive architecture. You know, it started with a book called Interactive Architecture that I read. And it talked about this, this idea of like the relationship between a space and a user of the space is a kind of conversation where both of them kind of inform each other in ways that are useful. And I started reading more about interactive architecture. And then I started finding out that in some circles, it's called responsive architecture. And I, I loved that because it really just kind of reinforced that mm. idea of a conversation. So I could create a design that is delivered to you, Yvonne, as a user, and it's going to respond to the changing shape of your browser window or of your device's display to present information in a way that's hopefully as usable and as meaningful to you as it can be, given the amount of space that it has to work with. That's awesome. I, it all makes sense when you describe it like that. And I'm so glad your wife had that experience at the Highline. I, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm grateful to her for a lot of things. And that's, uh, that's, that's definitely one of them. So it wasn't just that this article was published, right? It was sort of the timing that you had, because it isn't enough for you to call it responsive web design. Right. You sort of have to have all the other pieces in place. So your labeling was one thing, but there are W3C standards that had to be in place, CSS3 and media queries, and that was very early on and still evolving. Browsers had to support it. Was there any particular event in the evolution where you could say and maybe point to mm -hmm. that's what pushed this kind of uh, design into mass adoption? That's a great question. I think it's hard to point to just one thing. I wrote the article and then there was this flurry of activity around it that I, I really wasn't expecting. Like I, I firmly believe like I met a publishing deadline and then everything that kind of happened after that was due to the credit of the community. One of the first like responsive designs that I remember seeing that wasn't one of my early prototypes was um, John Hicks, who's a designer and illustrator in the UK. He designed the original Firefox logo and he redesigned his, his personal website to be responsive. And it was beautiful work. John's a wonderful designer and his, his site was, was, was and is beautiful. But I think that once he did that, and, and there may have been others, but this is the one that I remember, but like as these designers started getting excited about this idea and publishing responsive work, that built a, you know, that built more excitement around the idea and it proved that it could be done and more folks started experimenting with what could be done with this idea um, on their websites. But that didn't necessarily translate into the next step, which is that mass adoption you mentioned. And I think the next step, at least on that path, was back in 2011, I worked on the responsive uh, redesign of the Boston Globe. And I think that was, the, that was, at the time, I believe, the first large-scale responsive website. And that I think that showed that no no organization kind of wants to be the first anything right like the first uh flash website the first css based redesign like taking that first step i think takes a lot of bravery and the globe at least because it was a new website at the time and the fact that they had a very significant portion of their readership was accessing their work on mobile devices it made sense for them to launch this new site with responsive design that also made it easier for a lot of other organizations of their size to be like, oh, this actually works at scale. So I think that definitely helped as well. I I don't even remember the web before responsive design. Man, quite honestly. You're not, yeah, yeah, it was a dark period, Yvonne. You know? it was. <laughs> <laughs> Man. And then there's this idea of mobile first. That sort of is about the same time or maybe later than... Then it has to have been after responsive design became a thing, right? Yeah. Where do you locate that? Yeah, mobile first, as I encountered it, predates responsive design a little bit. Um, I'm not sure. I, I may not have encountered it until afterwards. But Luke Rubluski, who's at Google now, he wrote this blog entry. And I think it was back in 2009 where he talked about, he coined the phrase mobile first. Um, and... It's yeah, I think it's still like like John's article. Um, I think it's still like an incredibly impressing piece of writing about the web. 
And and Luke's writing at a time when the, the iPhone is almost basically hot off the presses. And he's basically arguing that we can't keep treating mobile as an afterthought. So we can't keep designing these desktop-based products and then think about what the mobile experience is going to be. He's basically arguing we need to invert that because mobile traffic is exploding. Mobile devices have all these new capabilities. And maybe most importantly, for me at least, we're designing for screens that are significantly smaller than what we're used to. So if we can start with mobile and figure out what really matters to our interfaces, mm. then that's going to improve the experience for everybody. It predates responsive design slightly, but it may not have been until after I came out with the article that I came across it. I think it's still a critical piece of design thinking, even today. Could you say his last name again? Sure. Because I have seen his name so many times and have never tried to say it, and I know exactly who you're talking about. He's got that uh, green astronaut avatar that he uses. That's right. Oh, yeah, right? yeah, exactly. He's uh, uh, LukeW.com or LukeW on Twitter, but um, I believe his last name is pronounced uh, Rabluski. Um Rebusky. That's how I've said it, and maybe he's been waiting 20 years to tell me, um, you know, how wrong I've been getting it. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, Luke's Luke's a, an incredibly uh, sharp and incisive designer. I've always really respected the way that he approaches complex problems. He wrote a fantastic book on form design, and his book Mobile First is still, I think, really fantastic. Yes. Yes, I might have to reach out to him and see if we can get him on the podcast can strongly recommend. What would you change about responsive web design now that it might be too late? Yeah. Man, that's a great question. I I don't know. So so in the in the article I kind of just said that like a responsive design has has three ingredients. It has a starts with a, a flexible or fluid grid as its foundation. It has flexible images and media that work inside of those fluid layouts or flexible layouts. And then, you know, there's media queries, the that little bit of pixie dust that allows us to articulate like oh, how changed. these things change mm -hmm. and adapt, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really just a three-step process. The reason I did that is because I wanted the, I wanted the definition to be as like broad as possible. Like I didn't want it to be super prescriptive and have like 15 different steps you needed to follow to make a responsive design. Like I really wanted to be, I wanted to keep as it, keep it as accessible as possible. But in part because of that, I mean, there's a whole range of things you can do with that ingredient list. You can make anything but a mobile first responsive design. You can make something that's targeted primarily for wider screens. And then you sort of like think about like, you still think about the mobile experience as an afterthought. You could make something that's completely inaccessible. You could make something that's much too heavy to be downloaded over somebody's data plan. But mm -hmm. at least for me, like that's not a distinction between what's responsive and what's not. That's a discussion around what constitutes good responsive design versus what might need some improvement or refinement. So I don't know. I mean, I did like recently, there's been some new tools that have come out, like container queries is something that's being worked on actively right now that... I've been clamoring for for a long, long time. Um, so rather than say looking at the the characteristics of the device or browser that's rendering your design and then adapting it accordingly with media queries, container queries are going to let us say like, okay, how much space do I have to work with inside this part mm -hmm. of my design, and then I can adapt elements inside that area accordingly. If this particular teaser component um, is going to be rendered at around four hundred pixels you know, draw it this way. If it's going to be, you know, 200 pixels, render it this way. And that for me, at least is our designs have gotten more component-y and more modular. Like that's the kind of design I've been doing more of anyway. And this is a, a massive ergonomic improvement over the way that I do that kind of work. You know, I wrote about this recently. I don't think that if you only wrote a if you created a responsive design that didn't use any media queries, but only used container queries, is that still a responsive design? I mean, I think so. Some of your listeners might have different approaches, but at the end of the day, like I think that you know that definition still holds up pretty well. I might tack container queries onto it, but I, I like the fact that it's just, um, it's not prescriptive. Like it's it's 
prescriptive enough, I guess, that it's three steps and then you're good to go. I, I think I would agree with you. I, I go back to what you said about responsive architecture and the, the tenant that you, that I think is underlying all of this, which is empowering the user and being responsive to the user. And I think if you include container queries in there, I think that still fits the definition. Yeah. And, and there's so many wonderful tools out there now for like listening to the user there are queries that we can use in our CSS to detect um, whether or not the users asked us to disable animations, which you know can trigger certain like motion sensitivities in our users. And mm -hmm. that's I think that's an incredibly important thing to listen to. But I wouldn't necessarily include that, for example, in, in a definition of what constitutes a responsive design. Do I think that makes for a good responsive design? Absolutely. But um, I don't think that that's necessarily table stakes, but I do think it's important. Now, about a year ago, you started a company in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> Great timing. Great, Great timing. timing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. my gosh. So you called it Autogram, and you started it with Karen McCrane and Jeff Eaton, who I think left Lullabot to start the company. And I love this thing that you, you that, well, this, this description that I saw of Autogram. It says here, you started it to work on big, tangly problems involving content management and design systems. Right, right. That sounds like an awfully big problem to solve. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but those are the best kind of problems, I, I think. The, you know, working with Jeff and Karen, two people I've had a chance to work with a, a lot in the past. You know, this this is they're they're wonderful folks, and I'm I'm so glad I got a chance to sit in a Slack room and talk about some of the stuff with them. T tell me about how it all started. What's the origin story? What, what's the itch you was you you and the and your and your two co-founders were trying to scratch? Uh, man, it probably goes back a few years now. So in the last like few years, more and more of my work has been less about um, working on responsive redesigns and more in helping teams and organizations do that work more effectively internally. So basically like helping the folks that are do the, doing the work execute on that work a little bit better than they could before or helping them figure out what problem, you know, work through some organizational bottlenecks. Mm. Um, but in super recent years, I'd say in the last like three or four years as design systems have really come, come into prominence, that's been more and more of a focus in my work. And I remember talking with Karen and Jeff in a Slack at the time about some of the, the challenges that I was seeing on teams that were dealing with design systems and how it wasn't necessarily improving the way that they were working. You know, sort of like it was making it in many ways a lot harder to collaborate with different parts of their team or different parts of their organization. Um, it was kind of fractally increasing the complexity of some of the products that they were working on, just in terms of like the technical infrastructure they needed to work with some of these systems and how the ways in which some of these systems were structured was actually making it harder for some of these people to see the impact of the changes they were proposing in their products. So, you know, trying to make a change to one specific component without being able to see how that's going to ripple out through other brands that reference that component or other products that use variations on that component. And so none of these are technical problems only. They really have to do a lot with how these teams are structured, how the or organizations are structured and how the design system itself might be like amplifying some of those pain points or reinforcing them. Mm -hmm. And so I was talking about th mm -hmm. this with Karen McGrain and Jeff Eaton, who have been kind of working in the content strategy space for so long and helping people think about the messages they're trying to communicate, how to structure content effectively um, and to work with that content effectively. And it's basically a lot of the problems I was describing weren't new and they're problems that they've been dealing with at scale for quite some time. But because design systems are relatively new, it's kind of like a new silo or a new manifestation, I guess, of some of these old, old issues. And so because we were seeing so much overlap in the work that we were doing, we figured it might make sense to, hey, suggest that these are actually very united problems that design systems and content management systems actually need to be thought about as a holistic set of issues and talked about together. 
so that's that's kind of where Autogram started is thinking about the ways in which people are approaching their publishing workflows, approaching their content management or design systems, and trying to help them articulate ways in which they can help them do that work better. Do you describe yourself as a design agency or a content <laughs> strategy agency or a consultancy or? Yeah, I would say a consultancy. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Coming into a company and being hired to either advise them on a project, they might have something that's underway already and they're looking for somebody who has perspective around content management or design systems, help them identify challenges they might face a little bit further down the road, give them some suggestions on things they might want to revisit, and think about some of the longer term impacts of some of the things they're thinking through. Could I hire you as a company who might have landed a new client that has that we're embarking on a new redesign with? <laughs> sure. Or would you want to be part of the original pitch to that project? Like, I'm trying to understand where in the process Autogram fits in. That Well, I mean, we are less than a year into Autogram's history, so we are in many ways, I think, um, figuring that out. I would say that we've been working with clients at different stages of the life cycle. We are working with companies that are trying to figure out how to select a content management system that's going to actually meet their needs. And so working with them to build kind of a, a map of their organization and think about like the ways in which they work currently and figure out a set of requirements that they need to start thinking about that they can then bring to a vendor to, uh, to think about that. It could be a company that's got an existing design system and they've identified some ways in which it's impeding their ability to ship changes or to work across design and engineering and coming in and sort of recommending some ways to, to kind of help them uh, sort of like streamline those issues. And I enjoy making a website as much as the next person. That's one of my favorite <laughs> things to do. I would say that we've been doing less like hands-on design work in the last year, but you know, the right client came along. I'm sure we'd, uh, you know, definitely that. talk to them. I might have to call you, Ethan. <laughs> Ethan. I will talk about design systems any day, and I will listen to Jeff and Karen talk about content strategy and content architecture any old day of the week. So, you know, we'd love to have that call. Okay, awesome. I want to nerd out for a little bit and talk about the name you chose, Autogram. Oh, man. Okay. I'm going to read what an autogram is, and then you can tell me how it applies. So the de the definition of an autogram is a sentence that describes itself in the sense of providing an inventory of its own characters. Right. So it's sort of a, how do you create a <laughs> sentence that does that is what I want to know. Because it's like recursive and you can't do it ahead of time. It's, it's very, it's blowing my mind. It's Tell perfect. me about I mean, it. This is like, this is one of the reasons I kind of feel like, you know, Jeff Eaton is one of the smartest people I've ever met. And so is Karen McGrain. But so Jeff came up, he, he was the one who uncovered this idea of an autogram. And um, if your listeners like look up what an autogram is, you'll find a bunch of examples where it's basically like a sentence that is describing its inventory, like you said. So something like this sentence contains only three A's, three C's, two D's, 25 E's, and so on and so forth until it gets to the end. And by the time you get to the end of that sentence, you realize like everything you've read perfectly encapsulates what you just read. Exactly. <laughs> I love yeah, it. Impossible to write, right? And this is the thing that I think like our clients who are in the middle of some of these like big tangly systems related challenges is they approach a lot of these problems as like, well, I will create a design system to provide more consistency across my products. And that's going to help us do this product work more effectively. But when you're actually in the middle of creating that design system or defining you know, some sort of content architecture, it's hard for you to see the end. It's hard to, for you to actually see the full scope of what it is that you're creating. I think it's our goal, at least with Autogram, to provide that broader perspective, you know, and hopefully come up with a, a sentence that by the end of the project, um, at least better describes what's, what's inside it. What a great name for a company. Well done, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> 
I yeah, it's hey, I can I can take no credit. That's all. <laughs> that's all Eaton. It's um, it's one of my favorite that's things. Awesome. As we wrap up, I wanted to ask you what what are you reading right now? What are you looking forward to coming up? Uh, there's still some some bits of the summer left. Would love to hear what your headspace is in right now. What am I reading right now? So I've got a few books going. When I go out running, I've got I, I've gotten into audiobooks in the last few years for when I'm out outside exercising, and that's that's been nice. Right now, I'm listening to The Ninth House by and I'm going to probably mangle the author's name, but Leigh Bardugo. You know, I'm, I'm about halfway through. I'm not sure what I think about it yet, but it's uh, sort of like a grimy version of Harry Potter. It uh, takes place at Yale. There's all sorts of occult things. It's, um, it's interesting so far. And then uh, I'm reading a book by Jane McAlevey, who's a labor and union scholar, and it's a fantastic book called A Collective Bargain, sort of arguing how unions are kind of at the core at... A healthy democracy. It's it's very well written. It's very short. Uh, that's that's probably the best thing I've read recently. And otherwise, uh, you know, I'm kind of just waiting for the next uh, entry in this uh, this trilogy called trilogy called the Locked Tomb. Two of my favorite books, uh, Gideon the Ninth and Harrow the Ninth, that I've uh, kind of devoured and reread over the last few years. There's another one coming out early next year, or I hope it's early next year. That uh, I'm just really excited about called Electo the Ninth. Um, so yeah. Yeah, can't wait for that. Wonderful. One. Well, it's been glorious speaking with you. I feel like I could talk to you for the rest of the day. Uh, likewise. Thank you so much for spending your time with me. It's just been awesome chatting with you. Likewise, Yvonne. This has been a real joy, and thanks for thanks for having me on the show. You bet. Ethan Marcotte is an independent web designer, writer, and speaker, and coined the term responsive web design. You can find him online at ethanmarcotte.com, on Twitter as Beep, and do visit Autogram at autogram.is. You've been listening to the 107 Podcast. Find us online at 107.com slash podcast. And if you have a second, do send us a message. We love hearing from you. Our email address is podcast at 107.com. Until next time, this is Ivan Stegich. Thanks for listening.